I will now uh, turn our attention to this evening's speaker. Professor Dominic O'Brien is a Professor of Engineering Science here at Oxford and he leads the Optical Communications Group and he's also the Director of the UK National Hub in Quantum Computing and Simulation. So looking forward to hear him talking about how the progress in quantum computing and um, I'll pass you over to him in a minute. If you have uh, questions, uh, we will have a, a question and answer session when Dominic's finished talking. Uh, if you can put your question into the chat facility in GoToWebinar and we'll pick it up and uh, put the questions to Dominic when he finishes speaking. So with that, over to you, Dominic. Good evening. So thanks very much for the invitation. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, yes, I'm Dominic O'Brien. I'm an engineer. I'm uh, in the Department of Engineering Science here at Oxford. And I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of uh, what's happening in, in quantum computing from the perspective of being in the hub in quantum computing uh, and show, show you some of the sort of challenges in, in um, building a real quantum computer and, and doing something useful with it, I guess. So let's get this thing going. So um, this is an overview. I'm going to give you a, a brief picture of the UK national landscape in the area in quantum and the broader than quantum computing and quantum technologies. Talk a little bit about our hub, a bit about what is a quantum computer, some of the challenges in building a quantum computer and some of the future prospects. So the UK has quite a large national program of research and technology development in quantum technologies. And, and that started back in 2014. Um, the first phase was launched with, with about uh, 270 million pounds of government money and, and more money was added to that. And there's been a lot of private investment as well. Uh, and that really covered all of quantum technology. And I'll briefly snapshot each of the major research areas in quantum technologies to give you an overall perspective. And the idea was this, that the UK was strong in quantum science and by a, a sort of injection of, of effort and capital, um, a new industry could grow from this strength in science. And it was always a 10 year kind of vision. And the first phase of funding ran from 2014 to 2019. And there was a hub uh, in quantum computing for those years as well. And that was uh, called NKIT and it was based here in Oxford with a large number of academic partners as well. And um, the second phase is what we're in in 2019. The second phase was announced and that runs till 2024. And you can see the amount of investment there. I'll talk a bit about the hubs, that the research hubs that that um, funding supported in a minute um, and it, it, it significantly for quantum computing there is also a national center for quantum computing which is uh, continuing to grow um, kind of a pace at the moment and I'll mention that as well. The story is there'll be uh, over a billion pounds of both public and private money invested in this area from 2014 to, to, to 2024 over those 10 years. And that puts the UK right at the top of national programs globally. So, so the UK has, has, has invested quite a lot in the area and, and you can start to see the fruits of that um, coming to bear. So one of the four areas was in timing. And so this is a picture of the UK technology hub in sensors and timing. So sensors might be very sensitive, gravity sensors, for instance, and timing, of course, the world runs fundamentally on atomic clocks and, 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 and if you like, timing based on quantum effects. Uh, and so um, timing, metrology, sensing are a, are a key area for quantum technologies. And you can see the partners in that, and that hub is, is led in Birmingham. Quantic is a hub led in Glasgow, and that's looking at imaging. So 
we're looking at each other through a CMOS camera. That's, a, that's an image that uses some form of quantum effect. Um, Quantic takes that further, looking at uh, it, it, some of the uh, more fundamental, if you like, quantum effects, and um, has produced a large number of different sort of techniques for imaging and, and, and making sense of those images. And, and you can see um, the sorts of things. They, these hubs have a, a great deal of industrial engagement. They've engaged in 100 companies and um, uh, products in development spin-outs, you'll see this recurring theme that the hubs are about a mixture of pushing forward technology research, but also understanding how to get it exploited uh, with a large range of industrial partners. Quantum communications is perhaps the most mature of all the areas you can buy quantum communications products, which allow you um, uh, sort of fundamentally secure point-to-point -point communications over optical fibers, that sort of thing. The UK has built a quantum network, which is a, um, a network of secure links between what they call trusted nodes. And you can see a picture of that in this slide. Um, it's also working on um, uh, quantum secure communications between small handheld devices. That's, a, that's an area that I'm interested in. And, and, a, and a wide range of other things to do with quantum secure communications. Before we get on to the hub, the National Quantum Computing Center is going to be important for the development of quantum computing within the UK. So as you'll discover, the hub is really a research entity. It's an academically led research collaboration. And so it's generating ideas, building small scale demonstrations, generating intellectual property, those sorts of things. The National Quantum Computing Center is about use by you industrial users scale up of particular technologies and ultimately delivery of a sort of national quantum computing service if you will for the nation just as we have other sorts of supercomputing services for the nation so it's 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 further up the chain of development and also it, it, it's focused more on scale up than, than will be the case for a research-led hub such as the the qcs hub i'm going to tell you about and I'd encourage everyone to have a look at their website. Um, it, 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 they're in a growth phase at the moment. They're planning buildings and there'll be a physical site for that at Harwell. That won't be the only activity by any means, but you can find out more about them by looking. Just if you Google National Quantum Computing Center, you'll find their website. So a bit about our hub. So we're a 17 university academic partnership and and um, the lead partner is the University of Oxford, um, but it's very much a partnership. So if you look, there's great strength across the UK, for instance, Royal Holloway grow superconducting uh, devices, uh, Warwick are interested in diamond, that's another quantum material, Bristol in photonics, uh, Edinburgh uh, strong in quantum computing theory, uh, uh, Bristol strong in theory as well, a, a wide range of skills across a wide range of places. That's the academic side, but there are uh, more than 20, to more, just less than 30, I think it is, industrial partners who are interested in quantum computing as well. And you can see a massive range of areas and a range of company sizes and, and, and makeup for that. So at one end, we have Rolls-Royce, who are a big user of computing power, be it conventional or, or in the future, um, quantum. Um, Pharmaceutical companies, Glasgow Smith Klein, um, Airbus, and then supply companies, M squared lasers, make some of the quantum tools that you need, for instance, and um, small startup companies, Oxford Quantum Circuits is a superconducting um, quantum computing company based uh, on work that was done at Oxford, for instance. Um, quantum Motion is, is another hardware company based on work done at UCL and some work done at Oxford. So there's a wide range of different companies involved in this as well. So what do we do? Well, quantum computing, and actually our hub is the quantum computing and simulation hub, and I'll explain what that means in a second, it, 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 is a growing field. It, it's not mature in the sense that we all use CMOS chips to do computing. So 
there's a diverse range of things that need to be investigated before, I guess, maybe in the future at some point, that turns out to be a best way to do things, as CMOS has turned out to the best way to do computing for most of us. Um, we're at this stage called noisy intermediate scale quantum computing at the moment. So we can have some qubits in, in a hardware platform, but those are noisy and the noise plays a large role in the performance of the machine. So it's not as if that's well controlled and is at a level that it doesn't affect the results, it really does. And so the question is now, how do you use that hardware which you know to be imperfect in the best way that you can. So that's the phase we're in at the moment, really, is people call it the NISC era. We'd like to be in this phase here, the universal fault tolerant era. Now, for a engineering conventional computing, universal fault tolerant means it just works the way it was supposed to work, but no, no more than that. So fault tolerant means it, it gives the right answer. So that's what we'd expect from our PC on our desk or something like that. So. But, but that's much, much more challenging to achieve with, with quantum computing. So, um, and universal means it will do general tasks. So that's the goal. Simulation is a very interesting area for quantum computing. Now, as we'll discover, quantum computing systems are analog by their nature. And of course, they're quantum. And there are some quantum systems like materials, uh, pharmaceuticals, things, certain molecules, where it's very difficult to model the quantum nature of their behavior digitally, but it's possible to map that onto a quantum system, a quantum computer, if you will, and simulate it in an analog kind of way. I suppose the closest analogy I think of is, is, is there was actually a tidal simulator at some point, I think, that they built that used real water to simulate the tide. And it's, a, it's not that, it's not the direct copy, but, it, but these, are, these are analog simulations of, of, of effects. And, and there's real promise for that because um, certain problems are very hard to do digitally, but if you can map them, it becomes easier and and these might be where some of the early wins might lie for quantum computing things like pharmaceuticals chemistry where there are very significant economic problems for for instance things like catalysis making a difference to that of not much a significant benefit where simulation and those sorts of techniques may may provide some of the early early gains if you will now so those are the themes and we work in lots of areas. So hardware, so the most interesting thing about this is there's no one qubit. So um, you can build them using iron, superconducting, using diamond, silicon, light, so that's photonics, and cold atoms, so that's uh, uh, um, neutral atoms rather than charged particles, which are the ions. In software, it looks a bit more conventional. So there are applications, algorithms, architectures, Verification and benchmarking is a different thing that appears in the world of quantum in the sense of there comes a point where you can't actually simulate uh, these machines classically. So it's going to be extremely challenging to work out whether it's working correctly. That's one form of verification. And also there's a question of is there really an advantage in using a quantum machine over a conventional machine is 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 it worthwhile expending the effort so those are the sorts of areas that that the hub works in and you'll see this there, there are many programs globally now and you'll see this uh type of program and this type of distribution of computing imaging sensing communications uh, um, repeated across the across the globe really so what is quantum computing now this is a very limited explanation that just really, the aim is to try and um, give some sense of why it's different and, and, and where its power might lie, but no more than that. I'm not an expert in the area. I can hand on questions and things to those that really know about the detail, but I hope this will just give a, a sort of flavor. So we all know about conventional bits. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a one, you have a zero. There's two states there. It's only it can only be in one at once. So it's either one or zero. So quantum bits, 
qubits, and we'll talk a bit about more in a second, let's say you have a one and a zero, it, it, it can exist in both simultaneously, this superposition. Now, when you measure it, it's either one or the other, but until you measure it, it can be both. And what does that mean? Well, um, let's take two bits, a two bit number. So, so one and zero, one zero, conventional binary number. That means one times two to the one and zero times two to the zero. So you call the two to one and the two to the zero, the kind of basis. And there's two bits that have two bases. Now, if you can um, join up your quantum bits, and that's called superposition, um, entanglement, sorry, and, 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 and make two qubits act together in a special way, for your two qubit number, if you like, you've got these four possibilities. Now, each of those, because they can all exist simultaneously in, in different proportion, they're each their own individual basis. So you've got four. So that starts to show you that because of this superposition and, and the ability to grow these long quantum registers, if you will, um, you start to build this enormous data space because for two, you got two for the conventional world, for two, you get four. So for n, you get two to the n rather than just n. Now, when you measure, you just get back in, but until you've measured, they can all exist in this um, superposition state. So a bit more formally, if I click the slide and it works. So for a quantum bit, there are these two basis states and for an arbitrary superposition is also a possible state. So you can have alpha of one and beta of the other kind of thing. So there's the analog nature coming in, alpha and beta are analog and, and complex coefficients. So you, you can get um, a sort of proportion of them both. And for a quantum register, as you grow n, you get this two to the n basis states, and that shows you the sort of exponentially growing power, if you will, or capability of, of this quantum system. Now, how do you process? Well, the register, if you like, some you have some initial value, initial state that you put in, and some operation happens that gets you to where you want to be, and then you read it out. So the readout will select one of these effectively, one of these bases, and tell you, and tell you about the, uh, 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 and that's all that can happen once it's read out. It's, that's the Schrodinger's cat. So till you look in the box, it's in both. And then when you look, it's in one or the, one or the other. So the art of quantum computation, it, 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 this, this is meant to show the sort of distillation of a solution. So um, the art is to build a system that when you do that readout, you get the right answer that you wanted to. And so it's got to evolve the quantum system so that the highest probability when you do the readout is the answer that you wanted. So it's a very different programming from, from sending some data in and, and sending it in. And it's extremely hard to look at the intermediate states as well, because if you do, you collapse it at that point and you've lost the quantumness. Now there is a way of doing it. So, so there's a, um, you can do quantum error correction and indeed it has to happen. You have to be very careful as you're doing the operations as to what you look at to make sure that you keep the, this superposition because that's where the power of the thing lies. So there are a family of algorithms where people have looked at scaling for both conventional computation and quantum computation and said, if you build a quantum computer this big, you can do it and you could never do it classically. And the one that people know about is Shaw's factorization algorithm. So this is factorizing um, large numbers. And of course, uh, the concern about that is that actually uh, our security systems are based on these. Just as an aside, that concern is well recognized and actually there's, there's a whole field of research, which the communications hub, for instance, at the quantum communication I'm interested in, which is to try and um, look at what's called post-quantum. So this is uh, cryptographic codes, which can be implemented digitally, which are resistant to the sorts of attack that a quantum computer could, could, could create. So 
this is a recognized issue and that there's, a, there's an international um, effort, if you like, to, to, to look at codes which um, uh, could be chosen to be the next generation of digital cryptography. But, but anyway, what it shows here is the runtime of, 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 a, of a factoring technique versus the size of the number and, and the sure for the quantum computer scales like this and the classical one scales like that. So that's the that's the worry in a way that the quantum computer could do it because it doesn't scale so badly with n. Um, so, so how many qubits do you need? Well, interestingly, you can simulate somewhere between 40 and 50 qubits on, on some of the, on the world's biggest machines. I, I couldn't quite tell you what the number is. Um, in Oxford, the, the, the machine that we have, which is a relatively modest in the world of supercomputing, um, probably can do about 40. So it shows you, once you get into that regime, it scales pretty quickly to, to very, very large uh, machines. And after that point, you can't simulate the state space because it just gets too big. Uh, so, so the idea is that, that what people think is that if you've got 50 to 100 pretty good ideal qubits that you could outperform what you did classically. Now you'll have heard of quantum supremacy, I guess. And what happened in quantum supremacy is they reached the point where it was, it, depending on, it, it was pretty nigh on impossible or not possible to simulate what was going on in the quantum computer with it, with the world's largest conventional computer. And that didn't do um, a useful task. It was a test task, if you like. And the next stage along is what's what people call quantum advantage, which is where a quantum computer can do a task which is useful that a conventional machine cannot do. And um, uh, th there's various estimates of when that's going to happen. I'll talk about that a, 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 bit, a bit later. So that's a bit about sort of state space, how it expands, what about the hardware? So as I said, it's quite diverse. So here's just a picture of, of different quantum computer hardware platforms. I'll talk more about iron. So this is an iron trap and it traps charged particles. You can use light, different states of light. So polarization, for instance, is one. And, and, and you, you build a set of sources, an interferometer, a sources of a particular type an interferometer to do, if you like, the processing on the sources to get them to interact. Um, you can build superconducting circuits. So this is probably the most mature and large scale of the platforms people have demonstrated thus far. So Google, IBM, people, Rigetti, other people have um, uh, superconducting platforms. And there it's, it, it, it's resonators and nonlinear elements that produce the, the uh, atomic uh, sort of analog of atomic systems, if you like. You can build them in diamond at the bottom here. So that's a solid state system. It spins of electrons in a particular defect state in, in diamond. Or you can use various electronic circuits. Again, it, 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 these are solid state um, semiconductor qubits of different types. So there's a diversity of different levels of maturity with advantages and disadvantages to both. But, but at the moment, it's not clear um, which ones will be, well, either whether there'll be one winner or which one will be the winner. Um, so just to show you an iron, so this is a picture of a real calcium iron, as you can see. In an iron, you're looking at two energy levels in the iron with some energy gap between them, and you can encode state, these alpha and beta coefficients between them. But the interesting thing is, because this is an analog system, errors build up. And so the quality of the qubit makes a big difference. So here are some numbers of the sorts of numbers you have to worry about. So frequency precisions of this um, 10 to the minus 12, and, and these sort of state preparation and measurement that just basically means the sort of quality with which you can control these things. But as you see, these are very, very um, uh, difficult numbers to get to. And I think the sort of comparison with the world of the digital CMOS is worth making at this point, but of course, the success of that 
is because it has a noise margin and it can cope with process variation because it doesn't quite have to be a one, doesn't quite have to be zero. And of course, after every gate operation, it restores because it restores, it switches up to the power supply and down again. So it's not as if it, it, it it kind of regenerates itself. So this is really very different and, and, and much more demanding as a result. And all the qubit systems, because they're analog, suffer from the same thing. So how might you build a gate, a reaction? Um, very brief explanation. So, so you might use laser beams to create electric fields and, and move ions around like that and, and get some nonlinear interactions. And I'm not gonna go through what that is, you start to, you can build these sort of transformations. So here's a picture of a two qubit states here, transformed, and this is what they call a, um, a phase gate. So you see, you can rotate them, you can add a phase to them. And actually, if you do some transformations, this turns out to be something that looks a bit like an XOR gate. So you can build, the, the key message, you can build quantum analogs of the sorts of gates we know about. Now, just to show you the sorts of things that you get and what they look like, um, this is just a, a nice movie. And these are, what you're seeing is light scattering off real iron sitting in an iron trap. And we'll talk about how that happens in a bit. Um, so what you're seeing there is those two flashes are when a measurement of that state is made. So the state is a superposition of, of the zero, zero and the one, one. So it's sitting in both of them at the same time. When you measure, it has to go to one or the other. And when it's bright, when, if it drops to one, one, when you measure it, it, you see two bright flashes. And when it drops to zero, zero, you don't see anything. And you'll see it's not, they should, they should occur equally probably, but, but given its probability, sometimes you get two of two and, and it doesn't occur one, then the other, one, then the other um, uniformly. And similarly, that's a, a different state. That's a zero, one, and a one, zero. And there, again, they're equally likely. So when you do the measurement, you see this flashing from left to right, left to right. So that's a nice demonstration of, 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 what, of what you sort of would see in a lab, certainly with an iron trap. So, so that's a very basic look at some qubits. Th this graph is really about, so it was work done by a colleague of my colleague, David Lucas, uh, and it was looking to see, well, how many qubits do you need and how good do they have to be to build something which is fault tolerant? So here's the log of the number of operations. So 10 to the 50 operations, well, that's fault tolerant because it's just running for a long time before you get an error. This is the errors you get. So 1% uh, error, 0.1% error down, down, down the left-hand side. And then the number of bits you need on a log axis. So there's some interesting things. So, so if the error is not good enough, you'll see um, this, the region between 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus three, that it doesn't matter how many bits you have, you're never going to scale up. So you need this, this threshold where at least you need bits of a certain quality to get, um, where you can start doing the error correction and things that you need to do to scale up. And here's some numbers as to kind of where we are in terms of what you can do. Now, these are what they call one qubit operation. So this is taking a single qubit and doing stuff with it. It's not a two, it's not a gate operation. And the superconducting ones there and trapped ions there, and you can see the sorts of position we're in at the moment. These are more recent numbers. So the 53 qubits of, of Google, David has put on just about here. But you can see we're very much in the, in the foothills of, of beginning to climb up that peak. So you need more qubits and they need to be better. Um, so that's a sort of picture of, 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 of qubits the registers, a little bit about um, how you might scale. I, th I thought I'd focus a little bit on a particular technology and the reason for iron traps is that there's a, that I've worked with the group in Oxford building on the engineering of some aspects of this. So 
that, that we can show a bit of detail about the sort of challenges of these things. Now ions are great in that they're really good qubits, but if you end up with very heterogeneous systems when you try and control them. So you need to put them in ultra vacuum. Sometimes you need to cool them. Now the ions themselves are, are can either be cooled using a technique called laser cooling, or you can cryogenically cool them, or you can do a combination of them both. Use lasers, so optical fields to control them, and those lasers themselves need to be very precisely controlled. They need magnetic fields, an RF and electromagnetic fields. And there's a lot of analog electronics which need to be distributed if you have multiple traps, and it needs very precise synchronization. So it's, a, it's an amazing heterogeneous engineering challenge. So if you look at a silicon chip, for instance, um, or even um, it, it, it's a it's it, it, it's at least all electronics whereas here we've got optics electronics mechanical engineering a, a wide range of things that all have to come together to, to to build to build an iron trap quantum computer so so here are some slides where we show the sort of ideas and the reality so on the left hand side there's the nice idea that you, to build an iron trap processor what you do is you build small processors of high quality shown here and you connect them using a process called entanglement which is essentially you take light photons come out of here and you interfere them in this system just here and that makes if you like the quantum connection it builds up the big quantum register that we talked about earlier so that's the I, that's the dream, if you like. The reality is something like this on the right-hand side here. So this is a lab. This is David Lucas's lab. This is one iron trap connected to another iron trap, and this is the optical connection here. So you can see the the scale of the issue is that there's many different things that you need to consider. So here's an iron trap itself. Now the iron traps are, 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 you can make relatively um, using relatively straightforward and standard processes that you might see in the electronics industry to make Siemens chips. And the features aren't that small. They are tens to hundreds of microns or millimeter scale rather than nanometer scale, as you might see in, in, in a silicon IC. Um, but uh, the, there's, a, there's a very interesting challenge of integration around this stuff. So to build them, well, when we were looking at building these modules or trying to work out how to scale them. Um, there's a lot of control, so you need a control bus. Here's one of these modules, these iron trap processors. It's connected optically, so you end up with a sort of mesh of connection, a bit like this. So here are the quantum modules, here are the entanglers, and that, that allows you to connect them together. Now, the sort of iron traps that, that considered for this need uh, I think it's probably more than 10 different laser wavelengths and, and laser polarizations coming in so effectively optical power is almost as important as electrical power so you can see the sort of uh, diverse nature of the challenge of building this stuff and so just to show you some of the engineering um, uh, sort of uh, push so the idea is with lasers, you build a rack of lasers and you have uh, fibers to deliver your optical power. Uh, the iron trap has beams of light coming into it. So in the center of this slide, you can see um, an iron trap. The iron trap itself is here. There's an ultra high vacuum surrounding. Here, it takes light from the fibers, makes it into the beam, makes it into the beams that need to go into the iron trap to control the ions and the readout comes out of this backside just here. The entanglers you can use relatively conventional optical fiber technology to build and this is one example of it here and that just shows you a mock-up of the sort of scale of the beam delivery. So this thing would end up doing about a meter long something like that about 80 or 90 centimeters high but really moving off the lab bench onto something that you might be able to put onto a rack but certainly not small. Um, now, of course, there's work to go on to try and remove all this optics and put it into a waveguide system within the iron trap, and that's going on at the moment. So, um, but this is not a, a, a one sort of material system kind of integration. 
control is very interesting. So, so control requires analog electronics and a lot of it and a very high precision because you need to better control in some cases the amplitude and phase of the optical beams controlling um, the ions. And this was some work that we did in collaboration with the Army Research Labs in the States and building an open source hardware uh, software control system uh, with very precise work on timing particularly because uh, once you start distributing ion trap processes around they need to be coordinated and synchronized to make this work properly. So that's just a snapshot of some of the sort of engineering challenges. Now that's one system, that's ions. In their own way each of them, so superconducting, diamond, silicon, are all pretty challenging and all pretty challenging to scale. They're analog systems. There's no intrinsic noise margin effectively. So, so if there's an error, if you don't get the analog voltage right, there, there is going to be some error there. Decoherence means that the, the bits don't stay in their sort of quantum locked states forever. And the world, thermal noise and other noise from the world will erode the quantum things that you have. So you need to do your operations quickly because you need to get the process done before the quantum effects have disappeared effectively. And so you've got this sort of gate time, how long it takes to do one operation versus how long the lifetime of the qubits is. So that's a challenge also. Fidelity is about how accurately you can set the states and undertake operations. And I think the key message is, is qubits in number are not enough. Now, error correction is possible and the better your qubits are, the less error correction you need. But it's, it's at substantial cost. Now, if you, in the world of digital communications, you, you can have good error correction with relatively modest overhead, like seven or eight percent, something like that. Whereas here, it's many times the logical qubit, if you like, the corrected beast, can require many, many, many physical qubits to get that way. So depending on the quality of those, those native qubits. So it's, it's a real challenge to scale things. An ion is a charged atom. Here we see two of them, a calcium and a strontium ion. They are superb, controllable quantum systems and we'll see we can store information into either one. Suppose our strontium is initially in state zero. We can apply a pulse of energy to switch it to state one. Later, for readout, we can use a laser that would have no effect on state zero, but our ion in state one will absorb energy and then emit it back as a photon, a particle of light which we can detect. Let's zoom out we see gold strips below. These produce electric fields holding our ions still without physically touching them. And again we see a laser causing an ion to become excited and emit its photon. Zooming out further, we see the gold strips are part of a small chip called an ion trap. And then we see surrounding electrical and cooling systems. A final zoom reveals the entire system is encased in a vacuum chamber which protects it from the atmosphere. Surrounding the vacuum chamber are laser systems, field coils and crucially a photonic link system to capture the photons into an optical fiber. This complete module is a small quantum processor but now consider two linked modules. When photons meet at the entangler unit in the middle the ions that created those photons become quantum entangled, and so the two modules combine as a single quantum machine. Extending this idea, we can have an entire array of modules. We can switch connections so that a module links either to a nearby neighbor or to another far away. In this way, we can have a highly connected and scalable quantum brain.
So that's a bit about hardware. What's happening in the world of software? Well, I mean, it, there, are, there are lots of elements to this. So, so we, there's quite a lot of software doing the control of the qubits. So um, the Google, the person that led the Google effort, I, I saw wrote, he reckoned there were 100 parameters per qubit that needed to be controlled in their system. And that's certainly not the case in an average CMOS chip. So there's an interesting control challenge. And there's lots of work on things like trying to optimize to control such complex systems. In the world of quantum algorithms, there's a lot of work to see where the speed up is and whether it really exists or not. So the search for a sort of set of algorithms where people understand there will be a good advantage in going quantum is, is, is ongoing. Things like factoring, search is an interesting area. Uh, Monte Carlo is another area of people, people have shown that, that there are some potential advantages there. And then because we're in this NISC noisy area, a lot, there's an awful lot of effort on what you can achieve with noisy limited qubits and trying to manage the noise processes and how do you control errors. And, and there's a diversity of program languages, IBM, Microsoft, uh, River Lane, Cambridge Quantum Computing, a wide range of companies working on diverse language elements. So, so there's an awful lot of activity that particular world. And I should also mention that there's a lot of work on emulation as well and, and show show particular thing, thing that's going on in Oxford. So there's still a lot of um, uh, benefit in doing modeling on conventional computers. And as I said, you can get to about 40 to 50 qubits on the world's biggest machines. And um, just uh, work that, that goes on in Oxford just to show you that this is a, this is a simulator that the uh, UK government has effectively funded through the hubs, through this hub called Quest. And you can, uh, that's an open source simulator you can find um, if you Google it. And, and, and that will work on everything from a laptop up to a large um, parallel machine with a nice mathematical interface. But this is only one of the sorts of things that exist, that there's quite a range of, of simulators that you can that you can find. And, and certainly, I think if you use the IBM uh, access, you can either run a simulator or the real hardware. So um, it's certainly an area of importance that, that will be there for some while, I think. What about the commercial landscape, just to, just to finish off? Well, in terms of platforms, uh, you can um, get access to a range of platforms. So most of them, uh, till recently, have been superconducting. So um, IBM, Rigetti, Google, uh, D-Wave, of course, have an annealing machine, which is a different sort of way of doing quantum computing. Um, uh, more recently, that there is there are iron trap uh, uh, systems. Uh, so Honeywell, for instance, an iron Q. Um, and then there's also some optical ones from companies called Xanadu, um, PsyQuantum is another one, uh, building large scale across this uh, or, or optical qubit system. Sorts of use cases people are interested, there's a lot of work in finance, um, logistics, so sort of traveling salesmen, route planning, delivery, those sorts of things, pharmaceuticals and, and, and sort of chemical is another area. And there's a lot of supply chain startups. So the UK program has sort of, um, certainly we, we have a, a, a quite a lot of activity in a UK supply chain. And we, we have the most startups. I think the number I saw from, from one survey was there's 23 startups in the area of quantum, both hardware and software, which is the sort of largest, largest number of any European uh, country, certainly according to the, 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 the data that I saw. So how the systems might scale, what, what, what do people say? So th there's been a sort of, if you Google around, you'll find Google, IBM, INQ, Xanadu, Honeywell, all have published sort of roadmaps recently as, as to where they think things are going. Um, and the problem is that the qubit number does not predict uh, isn't this isn't the best measure of scale and there are different measures of scale around as to as to um, what was a good way to say is it what scale you're at so Google are talking about a million qubits by 2030 IBM are talking about a thousand in a couple of years iron Q so these are iron trap qubits um, iron qubits uh, they have that number by 2023 and and a thousand sort of back end of this decade, but that's using a lot of error correction. So, so really the number of physical qubits will be larger than their qubit 
uh, metric. And the sort of numbers that people talk about for quantum advantage, remember this is the a particular problem which a quantum computer could do better than a classical machine. The sort of mid 2020s uh, I've seen mentioned, um, it depends again on, on, on who, who's, who's talking about it. But I think that, that there's been extremely rapid progress recently. Uh, and, the, and the fact these roadmaps exist and people are, people are publishing them means there's some confidence that, that this progress is going to continue. So to conclude, it's seen very rapid development, I think, as a field uh, in, in the past few years. Uh, and, and we've seen this uh, above 50 qubits demonstration recently. Uh, and the sort of path to what you might call a universal machine is, is, is not, um, is certainly not around the corner, but I think that, that the roadmaps people are publishing makes it seem uh, end of this decade, beginning of that, that, that sort of order, um, depending on, of course, who you speak to. With that, I'll leave it and uh, hopefully uh, that, 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 that's um, created some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, for a fascinating talk. Um, and um, you very kindly offered to answer questions. If people have got questions, they need to type them into the chat window in GoToWebinar um, and then we'll pick them up and, and ask Dominic uh, what, you, what you need to know. Um, I'll just kick off. I, mean, I, I was a little surprised towards the end there where you saw finance as a potential uh, a use case for quantum computing. Um, finance is an area where, in my experience, everyone wants everything to balance to the to the penny in in very large numbers. What what sort of applications would you would would there be for quantum in finance? So, so uh, particular things might be um, uh, portfolio optimization is one I've heard of, for instance. So it's it's looking at how you would buy and sell a portfolio to optimize its performance against some metric. So, you know, those sorts of complex decision-making optimization kind of things. Um, and other things, I think I've seen stuff on um, uh, kind of modeling of, 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 of financial systems, those sorts of things. So I think not the balancing of numbers, but more the decision-making prediction, uh, those sorts of areas of finance. Right, thank you. We've got a number of questions and I'll, I'll, I'll go through these. Uh, there are more coming in uh, by the minute. Um, and so the, fir the first one is from Ilkin Jamali and he's saying, do we have a quantum computing already and try to scale it up or are we trying to create one from scratch? I'm not sure whether that's, that's you in Oxford or more generally. Well, certainly um, uh, in Oxford, we, we don't have one, um, but the quantum computing does exist. You can use, say, you know, the, the, the IBM. Have, you could, everyone can sign up for IBM and use, use a small scale quantum computer. Um, and so they are to some extent in a phase which is being scaled now. Um, the platform is all at different stages of maturity, but yeah, they certainly exist. Sean Askey has asked, um, can you model out the noise and push it out of the situation? What people have done, I think this fundamental answer is no, because it's random. You know, in the sense of that the, 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 you, could, you could model it, you know, you can model it to some extent, um, but, but given it's random, you're not going to be able to um, <clears throat> fully under fully model it. Uh, what people do is um, they can, uh, I guess, what's the, they can sort of predict its effect. If if that's a if that's a different thing. So so a lot of it is about. Um, uh, 
building so for instance you might you might know that noise affects your gates or something in a certain way so what you do is use the middle in a different kind of way i suppose it, it that's a sort of mitigation but it's more a mitigation of the effect of it than it, than the thing itself so the next one i've got from david marcroft who says how are superconducting circuits kept at a low temperature right so that's a that's a great question so um they use what's called the dilution refrigerator so we have quite in, in oxford has quite a sense so for instance people may have heard of oxford instruments locally um they, they make such things so they're uh, refrigerators that that will get get them down to millikelvin temperatures so um and and there's a various sort of sets of cooling which will get you to that point so um yeah and th those are fairly standard i mean it, it, things you can buy one get it installed switch it on and it will cool you down to that so that used to be what people felt was quite a uh, a barrier but but that technology is now fairly mature or no not fairly mature is mature right um We've got a comment which is from Peter Morgan um, who says that the the number of qubits that you showed for INQ is is out of date and there's a much higher number now um, I'll leave that one with you oh um, thank you <laughs> now it's use, uh, useful to know I, I I must admit I I will talk to the person that gave me the data but, but um, thank you um, Matthew O'Keefe uh, has asked, could you give an example of how an unmeasured state could be ever checked? Uh, I think the fundamental, look, if you want a proper answer, I will talk to the people that do that because I, I can give, there, there are analogues of error correcting codes so of the sort of parity checks one might do in, in the classical world. But the detail of, of, of that is, is I, I, I'm not going to be able to answer for you. But I can take that. If, if you give some contact details, I'll take it to people and get you an answer. Right. OK. Yeah. Um, so Chris Wheatley is asking for a, um, an explanation of what a qubit is. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a, a way. It's more what a qubit does than, than what it is. But it would be my way of explaining it and why it's different than that of a. a right. I th so a qubit, I suppose, is one state in a system that can. Uh, behave in a certain you know satisfy the things like superposition and entanglement and of course there's no one qubit because there were the, you can use an iron you can use a superconducting circuit but but the sort of idea of two levels one of them being labeled the one qubit and one being labeled the zero qubit uh, that have a certain set of interactions between them which allow you to do this superposition and entanglement that they meet certain conditions so um that's that's about the explanation i've got at the moment i guess thank you um so xu yu liu lin sorry xu yu lin um has asked which type of qubit implementation optical iron trap etc do you think are the most promising i think it's i think you can observe the I don't know the answer, I think, is the, the, the simple one. I think you can observe the maturity, if you like, and 
so superconducting uh, and ions to some extent so so ions have have the best performance the best fidelity of any qubit at the moment but they have some issues about speed compared with superconductors for instance superconductors uh, 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 you'll have demonstrated the largest number so the question then is i suppose which one of those um are you going to excuse me um the challenge is which ones of those are you going to be able to solve but there are also other systems like diamond which is much less mature but you can see the solid state systems being much more amenable to higher levels of integration and things like that so it's, it's very early days to know what, what's going to be the ultimate um, uh, winner or even if there will be just one so that's not an answer to your question, but I'll probably explain why. So Austin Murat asks, what contributions will quantum computing provide for the internet? That's a that's a that's an interesting question. Um well I think firstly there will always be um a need for it in greater computational power if you like so you know that 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 a quantum computer could sit somewhere on the internet just as a google server farm sits on the internet there is a a a, a, a branch of development of research to, to try and look at how the conjunction between quantum communications and quantum computing creates some uh, quantum internet and that might involve um, concepts where you are um, uh, sending your information to a quantum computer and want a result, for instance, but you, there, there are various degrees of um, uh, trust of various elements in that process. So you, you're sort of combining this idea of trusted communications and computing. So that's a sort of quantum internet concept. That, that people are beginning to sort of lay out a roadmap for, for instance, Europe is uh, laying out, thinking about that at the moment um, uh, within, the, within the sort of EC research community. And there's, there's, there's the UK, the US has some big efforts in that area as well. So those are the sorts of aspects where I think that it, it, it may play a role. Okay. Thank you. I guess to slightly follow on from that then, what's the progress of quantum computing in other countries compared to the UK and is there anything we can learn from them? That's a question from Ash Badgama. Oh okay from Ash. Hi Ash. <laughs> um, I, look, I, the, the, um, the, the biggest scale systems have been uh, you know uh, the Googles and the IBMs of the world are, are the, probably the most um, uh, mature and I think um, we've learned from them that you can make a lot of progress with investment and um, in terms of the sorts of um, leaders in particular areas of uh, science um, the UK is has, has world leading activities in certain areas not in others um, and you know we'll learn from the, the groups which are which are around the world which are which are better than we are um, I think in terms of the sort of uh, national programs and things the UK ha has a lot to be proud of in the sense of it, it, it it's seen as an exemplar program worldwide so I wouldn't say we have so much to learn from others but the sort of success of continued investment in the area that, that you see in say the US, then then I think that that that's something we could learn or should take on board. Thank you. Um, got a question from Matthew O'Donnell here, um, who says, in terms of the geo geopolitical cyber warfare sphere, what starting pistol gun smoke will indicate that we're into a cryptography arms race between nation states. I guess that's a reference to 
what you what you showed about the um, the factorization algorithm and so on. Uh, good question. Um, well, I suppose if there was an event that, that somebody had sort of demonstrated that they had successfully factored a very large number with a quantum computer, that's the sort of event that would um, uh, create a lot of attention, let's put it that way. I think that that's, uh, as I said, that, that, so, so for instance, there's a, a whole element, a whole range of post-quantum research going on about cryptography systems, which will be resistant to this, this attack. So, so I, I don't know, but my feeling is there's not going to be a, it's not, it's not a single event or anything like that. It's not a starting pistol that, that, the, the, you know, people's minds are on that already. Um, so, so I, I, I can see a sort of ev evolution of computing power, but post quantum, uh, digital cryptography evolving similarly. Um, so now a question from Simon Ashby, who um, says, what are the low level engineering job opportunities in this field or are they all high end openings? Um, <laughs> There's no such thing as an engineer. There's no such thing as low-level engineering. <laughs> there's an awful lot of, of of opportunity, I think. So, so if you look at, for instance, the um, uh, you know cryogenics, that's mechanical engineering, electronics, high vacuum, uh, um, optical engineering. So, so there's a a wide range of, uh, and in fact. I think that sort of success once a field evolves and and there's less that, that, that it matures then then the balance of what might be called you know the balance of of the detailed knowledge of the physics but engineering of the system is going to shift to engineering of the system so I think there's a you know we have a a, a massive nationwide shortage of engineers anyway and and this is an area which is going to need a lot of engineering. So I think that there are a wide range of opportunities available. And in fact, it, it, it's one of those things within the national program, there's an awful lot of thought about how the sort of retraining, training, all of those things go on. So for instance, I'm involved with the IET and, and there's an IET part of the push in that, in that sphere is to, get, is to get quantum engineering or quantum, you know, the electrical side of that. Um, uh, yeah, there's a follow-up that just came through from Simon Ashby saying, "What about cross-discipline, wide, wide engineers, as it were?" Oh, I, I mean, to me, that would be about the system, uh, and I think that that is one thing where there hasn't really, because certainly for for you know for those sort of less mature things, the system getting you know the balancing of a system and things is is going to be one of the future tasks because that really just hasn't been done yet to the extent it may have been in in something that's very mature i've got what what looks like a fairly specialist question from stanislav sana which i think i will i'll just read it but i think this is probably something that's better if i do this after the meeting for you but could you please share a few references for the error collect correction algorithms that consume qubits to in increase fidelity and protect against decoherence i can certainly get i it's not something i do now but i can certainly i can certainly find some for you next one is is what about traffic simulation i guess that as a as a potential use case is that something that people are doing uh, that's a good question. I, I, that is not one, ah, maybe it is. So people have certainly done root finding. I think there was an experiment. So, so people like BMW and VW have done a fair amount of work. And 
my memory is that there some, was some work about routing buses and things, and I don't know whether that involved traffic simulation. Um, so a question from John Harper says he'd be interested to hear about the current progress with the application of machine learning algorithms in quantum computing, particularly interested in the application of generative adversarial networks, but it would be great to hear thoughts on existing landscapes and any exist interesting channels to keep our eyes on as they progress. So, so there is work on quantum machine learning. Um, and in fact, bizarrely today, I heard about some work on generative adversarial networks. So there is work and I can say, I, probably I can send references would be the, would, would be the best thing to do. I think it's worth making one remark that um, it, 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 there isn't really a sort of analog of quantum RAM in the sense that the, in the sense that the the states um, it, it's very difficult to sort of program. You have a limited number of input states uh, and the state space kind of grows from that so things that are sort of data rich like quantum like um uh neural networks and training and those sorts of things are, 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 it, it, it's it's more challenging um to put those onto a quantum computer not say people haven't done it and, and there are certain you know there, there are certain algorithms which will do it but it's not there are there are some real challenges in doing so. But I can send some references. I think would be the easiest thing to do. Uh, Michael Miller wants to know: Is there any work being undertaken in healthcare, for example, in uh, use of genomics in personalised healthcare plans? Um, I'm trying to think. That's not so, so. So the healthcare side of things is the, 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 the things you tend to hear about are things like drug discovery and stuff like that, rather than what you're mentioning. But um, I can I can look and I I can certainly pass things on if I can find them. Um, Sergio Alvarez is asking, where are we with encryption and what to expect in next years? So um, in terms of uh, the sort of digital um, post-quantum, uh, my, my understanding is there's a sort of competition for um, a potential post-quantum algorithms that's being run by NIST in the US. And, and that I think has down selected to a handful of potential things to replace what we what we use at the moment. But that that's a I'm sure you'll find much better information on the internet than me. In terms of um, the sort of security side of quantum computation and how you make these things secure, people are interested in in um, what they call remote entanglement. So this is, if you like, when I showed the quantum registers, that sort of connection between the bits to build up the registers, it, 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 this entanglement, you can make that remote and therefore you can have some interaction between two bits at some remote locations and that interaction can provide you with some security part because of doing something to this, you can do something to that. And, and that's, that, that, that's a remote, operation. So there are elements of quantum computation and as I said quantum communications that come together around this remote in, this entanglement if you like uh, and and so that is one of the security aspects people are looking at. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay thank you. Um, another one from Xu Yu Lin, who's asking, what's the typical development cost for an iron trap computer with, for example, 40 qubits? 
I don't know. So um, I think that, <laughs> that, that probably a good answer to that is to go to say, the INQ website and see what they say, how much investment they've had, because I, I suspect that's, and I my memory is it, it, that's in the sort of 50 to 100 million dollar range, but I would be speculating, I think. So, so I think it, it's very difficult to, um, say sort of what the costs are but but not not astronomic mm. you mean know, the investment in 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 say a server farm these days is, is significant um yeah yeah um, and and indeed the the cost of early super supercomputers was that sort of level from right from the start mm. the, the really big ones um, so there's a question here, what does Grover's algorithm try to do? Is it something on searches? Yeah. Which is from Olivia Bob. Yeah. <laughs> it, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, it's a, it's a, it, and, and I think the search thing is where, where it's this aim of getting the highest probability state is, is, is the search answer that you wanted so when it when you measure that's what you get another question for from William, William Gallifent who's our, another person who's obviously interested in trying to get into the field um, from the position of a generalist C++ developer what should someone aim to learn in order to have a chance to move towards working in this field and are there any good training resources? So, so um, I think and I had to think about this question. Which I thought I thought it might come up. I think so, so. IBM, for instance, with their that they have an awful lot of of, of training stuff um, available and, and resources. So that that'd be one place I I I, I might look. Um, and they've invested quite a lot in in that particular area. So you know there'll be mo many of the universities will really have master's courses those sorts of things and some for instance ucl i know i think have some cpd courses as well so looking around you will find training resources uh what in terms of generalist i mean uh, depends what you wanted to do uh there would be of course uh, programming opportunities for things like the control all of those sorts of things and and, and um conventional languages will work for those sorts of things i'm sure that, that you know there'll be hardware to control that sort of stuff um i guess sort of yeah i i as i said i think i think looking for the sort of uh, open source online ibm one place to go um, there will be stuff there for, from various uh, different vendors and I do think there are opportunities it's not going to be a field where everyone is going to go through a degree in and a PhD in quantum physics there, there will be um, kind of retraining and it will be needed to have enough people um, a question from payment Kazimika, my apologies if I got the name wrong. Um, is there a way to build a hybrid platform quantum computer combining optics and ions to reach out to quantum advantage sooner? Um, so uh, some of the ions, so, so the iron trap architecture that, that connected architecture I showed you actually uses light to, to, to do its uh, connection between the processes uses photonics a, 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 and ions. Um, so in some set that senses it's hybrid. Um, the, uh, I, I don't know enough about what a hybrid of, you know, more optical processing than that would be because essentially that's just, that's one, sing, that's one single element of, uh, of optics, I, I, I'm not sure what 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 the optimum design will be, and, and so you know all, all these architectures 
um, I suppose require some thought uh, as to whether there would be advantage. Um, Michael Miller has asked, is there any work being undertaken to improve cyber security using quantum entanglement? I think that's slightly different from the other security questions. Yeah, there is. And, and, and in fact, that's part of the quantum internet, if you like. That, that, that you know, the sort of, uh, at the moment, that uh, um, if you want to do, if you want to use quantum security in, in a, um, you can do point to point quantum communication. So effectively, uh, people like BT have done demonstrations where what they've done is taken a low bit rate QKD link. And the job of that is to distribute keys, cryptogra standard cryptographic keys. And then they encode high rate data using those cryptographic keys. But the quantum link allows you to refresh the keys pretty often. Um, now, that only works between what they call trusted nodes because, it, because you have to decode at one end. You have to lock the box so nobody can get in so that when you send it off to the next link, nobody's interrupted the bit in the middle. And entanglement can remove that problem because it, 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 it's a, a different way of distributing security so you can build uh, intermediate nodes and those sorts of things. So there's a whole set of architectures about trying to 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 move on from this point to point trusted node things, uh, and they all entanglement plays a big role in that. So a question from Sheila Lloyd Lyons. Um, so if she's understood correctly, could this be used to get a best estimate given the current knowledge for for an outcome of a system. So, yeah, I'm just trying to work, I'm trying to uh, decode that slightly. So, I mean, I would, yeah. guess, I would guess that might be preempting what Sheila might be asking, but um, it's, Certainly, if Monte Carlo simulation is a way of doing, I think, what Sheila's asking about, and you'd said that that's a potential application. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly, certainly, those sorts of things, sampling and, and, and particular models of sampling are, are, are certainly of interest, and people are working on those. And that's one of the things that shown, shown you know, uh, is one of the algorithms people think there's, there's promise. Okay. Um, Michael Miller again asking, is there any collaboration with EU countries and perhaps China in this area? Or which countries uh, do you collaborate with? <laughs> so, so there's a lot of international collaboration. So uh, for instance, um, many of our hub partners are in the EC project. Some, you know, people have global collaborations in, in this in this area, I think. So, mm -hmm. so it's still, you know, this is early days for a lot of it. This is in, in, you know, an international effort. Hmm. So question from Conrad Bashutz. Um, do you ever have worries that quantum computing won't reach the levels of advancement and practical application that people hope for? Oh, I think we, we you know, as, 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 as researchers, we have to have optimism in, 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 in in what we do, um, I think um, there's an awful lot of effort and momentum worldwide across a wide range of people, um, and as far as I'm aware, there's sort of no kind of fundamental um, barriers that people have come across yet to, to scaling further. Um, and I suppose the question might be at what cost in terms of resource and also in what time scale. But, but um, 
as I said, I, I'm probably an optimist naturally anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a corollary of that, is it is there a risk that you know the the conventional computing will will advance and actually achieve the same sort of levels of performance in the same time frame? Uh, there, I think I'm less. You know, that I guess the scaling is so different. And if you can access that scaling, then if if it's not, and, and you really believe that, it, it may be that, that conventional computing might be able to meet it at some point. But you no, know, Moore's law for quantum, if such a thing exists, would mean that into the future by some limit it you know it would get increasingly difficult to do so and of course yeah not without not without vast resource cost in the conventional computing world that's not to say i don't think that you, you know it's not going to be one thing or the other and of course many lots of the quantum computing needs an awful lot of pre-processing in the classical world and post-processing in the classical world and people are looking at hybrid algorithms which do a bit of both so i don't think it's one or the other by any means and i'm sure that um uh you know the quantum computing resource will be will be much rarer um how quickly can the initial qubit state be prepared another uh i don't think it, well i would to, to give you real numbers i would have to talk to people in the individual systems but it very much i think it depends on, on you know ions have one set of time constants the big inductors have another those sorts of things so it, it's very system dependent i can look if that's a question i'll take away with me and i can try and find some other some proper information for you um i'm conscious of the time and we still have quite a a number uh more questions so i'm going to um i'm going to use my prerogative to to pick a pick one or two out um, uh, from that. Um, let's see. So the question um, here from um, Aidan Thompson: Any thoughts on the promise of scaling systems based on photonically active silicon spins? Well, I can, you, you can make some broad remarks about silicon that that um, it's it's a system where um, processing is pretty mature. And the sort of challenges of fabrication, you know, whether it be photonic waveguides on silicon or, or you know, uh, um, uh, CMOS circuits, or to, that you can use possibly for um, uh, quantum computing, so some of the spins within that. Um, I think I, I don't know enough detail about what the technical challenges are. You can see the potential advantages because of the platform. And, and how that scale, how that might scale, simply because it's in silicon, and that's a we know that's a very scalable material system. Um, that would be all I would say. I mean, I can, if that's a question of real interest, I can, I can get some further information on it if you like. Are other sciences benefiting from collateral ideas and techniques thrown up during quantum research rather for, than that's, from the computing itself? That's a really nice question. Um, so, so just today, the, the, if you look on the UKRI website, the, there was a, an announcement of a program called, now I can try and get the answer, you get the program name right, Quantum Technologies for Fundamental Physics. And this is a, an idea that actually the sort of uh, quantum technologies program that's been going for the last half decade or so in the UK 
has started to create devices and capabilities which will be of use to the fundamental physics measurement community. I, I think the, the basic idea was we were you, you can be getting a larger and larger set of more and more, sorry, a smaller and smaller set of larger and larger, more expensive um, uh, experiments for, for, for fundamental, you know, the large scale fund colliders, etc. Whether there was anything that these new devices and capabilities could kind of bring to that challenge. And I think we'll increasingly see uh, some of the techniques spinning out to other areas. So for instance, the um, in the hub, we work on diamond uh, as, a, as a qubit system, but, but you can build a magnetometer using uh, diamond and that you can use to uh, detect a heartbeat. So that's a sort of spin out of, of, of work that's come really investigating it for quantum purposes. So and increasingly those sorts of things will happen, I think. So for instance, also just as a quick example, the diamond has a, uh, you need a cavity around it to, to um, get some of the photons out with high efficiency. That cavity turns out to be quite good sensor. And there's a spin out company, Oxford HiQ, you can find them on the web who are using part of that to build sensors for particles, those sorts of things, and for biological particles. So increasingly that's going to happen. Okay. I think that's probably a good question to, to end end on. Um, been very generous with your time. Thank you, uh, Dominic, on answering a, a series of uh, quite wide-ranging questions there. Um, <laughs> There were, were a few more, but I think in the interest of time, I am going to uh, I'm going to close the the question session there and hope that in general people have have got most of what they wanted to know answered yeah. one way or the other. I hope um, so. I hope so. We will um, be posting the video of tonight's meeting on our website in due course, um, as as we do for all of our meetings so if people want to see it again they'll be able to look at it there and obviously the slides are available there and I guess we will also try and load the little video that you that you had that uh, proved a little too risky to um, <laughs> yes. uh, to, to show through the, the, the webinar system but uh, we'll try and include that if you're willing with the uh, with the presentation oh, that's fine, when that's fine. Yeah, yeah. we'll either do that or we'll put the link on the presentation which you yeah, might we'll see what works right so um the one thing that we we miss when we have uh these the webinar rather than the physical meeting is it's it's not so easy for the audience to say thank you to the speaker um i think at, at this point we would be having a very loud and hearty round of applause for a fascinating talk and uh, some some very interesting answers to uh, to all of the questions um, unfortunately we can't do that I've got a few comments on the on the chat which have expressed their thanks and appreciation for what you've what you've uh, shared with us this evening but I think it's probably just me to say Thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for the Thank invite. You. Bye now. Bye now.